I have to say that's probably one of the most complete and um, I think uh, really well-rounded discussions I've ever been part of on this subject. And Adam, that was a great setup. Thanks a lot for that. And Chris, there, there is no governing body, but uh, you know, there are folks that spend a lot of money who could just start doing it. You know, that could happen. Um, so we're gonna transition, this is the, the way we ordered this was to start with the, the basic metric discussion and talk about can we have a holistic marketplace um, and can we have a currency that facilitates that fluidity uh, but then we have spoken about, uh, in, our, in our measurement discussion yesterday, we hit on a couple of other, like layering on top of that, is there a necessity for um, a qualitative metric? That if, if we could agree on an impression-based marketplace that allows dollars to flow between a linear and an on-demand environment, do those impressions need to be qualified? We know we can qualify them with a demographic uh, definition, but does it also, is there a way to assess value with an engagement metric? Um, Kathy in our discussion yesterday brought up the idea of um, time spent with the commercial, with the commercial in the environment that you're purchasing. Is that a way to dial up or dial down the price um, or value of an, of an impression? Uh, and I think a uh, gentleman from Nielsen, I don't know if he's here today, yeah, there he is. He brought up the idea that um, Nielsen is working on uh, a brand lift metric that could be applied to impressions. So I think what I'd like to do is just have each of them, oh, and there's the engagement side and then there's the viewability side. So we have 20 minutes to sort of just talk about this subject. Um, and I think on the engagement front, let's just have each of them explain what they mean by, you know, the suggestion they've made and whether or not they think that should be part of the currency or whether or not they think it should be part of a valuation metric like Adam was talking about. And then maybe we're gonna get into viewability if this discussion you know, can come to an end early. So you wanna start? Uh, so actually, whether it's part of the currency or valuation really was my question kind of coming into this uh, meeting. Uh, so I'm actually asking the question as much as I am answering it. Um, you know, in, and, and my position has actually kind of changed or shifted a little bit over the past two days, and I do see it more, uh, 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 based on a lot of what's been said and a lot of what Adam just discussed as more of the value um, that is independent to each of the different uh, purchaser of, of the impression, um, but to keep it at the lowest common denominator. Uh, I do believe that the, the, the impressions, the impression, and the, you know, any kind of... Uh, the impression uh, is the stock share. Is the stock share, and whatever the value is, is the value to the individual purchaser, whether it's based on brand, you know, my, my take is brand lift would be uh, a pretty universal one um, and good to have, but it would be definitely more on the value side, uh, you know, in, independent. and not. Can you tell us how Nielsen's measuring that? So the way that Nielsen kind of views the, the, the world <laughs> is they put, uh, they have everything in one of three buckets. It's either reach, resonance, uh, or reaction. Uh, so the, the OCR tool and XCR tool fall, falls neatly in the reach bucket, which is the primary you know, core of what, uh, of what uh, you know, Nielsen's trying to evolve the industry uh, towards in terms of guarantees, buys, and a lot of the other things we've talked about. Uh, in, the, in the resonance bucket, it, we, we have a few products, the IAG, the old IAG tool, TV brand effects, as well as Visu, which is my, my background. Um, and what, the, what, we're try, what we're looking to build is a reach resonance tool that combines all three of those tools, so OCR or XCR, as well as the uh, TV brand effects or the old IAG plus the Visu for the digital side and really come out with one sort of index where th with the two combined, you can really decide, you can really understand how both the reach and resonance together are impacting, uh, you know, are, are working within the environment. And then eventually uh, a reaction, some sort of sales tied to sales would come into place also. Um, but again, it kind of, it, it really is more, in thinking of it from a buy side versus a sell side, it really is more 
on the buyers to you know come up with that on their own to set the price for the the stock you know in this case the impression um, so it's you know I, so I think it's it is more of the value side where that would fall in okay so then what we can count on is that Nielsen will be providing a um, they'll be providing a tool for impression based measurement across different platforms with OCR right. and XCR right. and you will give the option to those who wish to use it to um, to have a common uh, engagement or brand lift right. metric in TV and in digital that right. can be and used mobile. Yeah, and, and mobile with your tools that will allow people to potentially up the price or ch you know up, up or lower the value of, uh, right. assessment of what they're buying or to or to set the value in in based on what they're determined you know what they consider to be uh, relevant to them. I mean, brand in itself yeah. is not just one metric. It could be, you know, it could be an awareness metric. It could be a, uh, you know, favor a, a favorability or purchase intent metric. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th that would change the value. Right. So it is subjective itself. because they could choose one or they could choose multiple ways of measuring that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's important to know. Can we have Kathy make the case for the time spent as a valuation? Excuse me. Yes. You have to stand up. <laughs> I am standing. <laughs> so um, we think that uh, a rating really is a function of the, the number of um, viewers and um, the time that is spent. So we do that today in television. Um, and it's a common metric. If that were an impression, you could um, change that a little bit to also include an impression in every single one of the screens that you're monitoring. And that's pretty straightforward and I think a pretty a good way to think about uh, making a common metric across. As you start to think about value, we do have household matches. It's not people, but it's homes. And we do look at various brands against those homes and we provide an index or a rating um, against that. So that piece of, of the valuation side can be judged on whether or not you can find the number of homes that you're looking for that are in the market to buy a specific kind of car, for example. On the time base, what we find as we begin to do more cross-platform work is that we have time in TV, whether that's time spent on linear TV or DVR or um, video on demand, but what we find is we add in online, and um, ABC is a great example. We get all of your online data that you send to us to report back to you. And some of your providers, the, what, the various sites where your content is placed, have starts, and they don't give us the time spent viewing. So in my mind, I feel that it's much, valuable, much more valuable to the advertiser if they know at least percentage of completion of the ad itself or the time um, that was spent on the content versus the ads um, also gives you another way of being able to value, did somebody actually stay there and view it for the complete time? So you mentioned two things there. You mentioned completion rates for uh, commercial, for, t for an ad. Mm -hmm. um, and then you mentioned the time spent with the program. Yes. Right. So for marketers, do you think one's more valuable than the other? I think both are valuable because the time spent in the program helps with the context. And if you look at the comparison of time spent with the ad and time spent with the program, and you look at it's that like across several different programs, you have an idea of whether or not you selected the right places to put your ads. Um, because you may get more engagement on one show versus another. So can I ask you to be a little bit more specific on something? Because um, mm -hmm. there's this thing formulating in my mind, right? There's this, the completion rates in digital are pretty, like, they're there. We can, we can, we can measure them. We can understand what a, uh, an advertiser's completion rate is with a certain vendor because um, there are companies that measure that for us. What would be the equivalent in television that Rentrack might measure? Well, we look at every second of viewing. So if, if a, a, and we use one minute for, if you're tuned into a network for one minute, then we go back and count every second. Tell of me viewing. about the ad. 
what Sorry? can you what, what what can you do ad that is, is five the seconds so if you're tuned into an ad for five seconds we look at every second that you view the ad and we give you an exact commercial rating okay i'm going to ask it a different way second by second <laughs> what is the equivalent in your mind for tv based on set top box metrics of the of the completion rate can you actually Give an advertiser a completion rate number on yes. TV? You yes. Can. Okay, so we could, we could add those two things together. Yes. And so you might say that ABC is delivering a 95% completion rate and uh, Yahoo is delivering, uh, let's do it the other way. <laughs> let's say Yahoo is delivering a 95 completion rate. ABC is delivering an 87% completion rate. That might mean that the Yahoo impression has more value to you. You might change the price that you pay for that. It might, but... Again, and talking about layering on different things, ABC might have, um, in that scenario, a lower completion rate, but it's against... Well, like the, a higher composition of car buyers or yeah, something. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's all fine. I think that... So the, inter the interesting thing here is w we've got two potential ways of measuring the value of commercial inventory that you're buying and the value of the engagement with the viewer that the media partner is providing. So uh, I will ask the, the group, somebody raise your hand and tell me if you think that is something that should be done as, p should that be calculated into the transaction? Like basically media providers are guaranteeing a certain level of completion rate? Or do you think that that's something that should be measured and uh, that the media partner should be valued, you know, the relationship with that media partner should be valued on the result? Who wants to give us a point of view? Well, that's, yeah, Rentrack doesn't measure that, but there are many companies that do. Right. Well, we, we don't get it when we do it. So you're saying that it's out there, but you don't know? You don't get, you don't get completion rates? No. Jess, does your company measure completion rates? For everybody that, that works with you? Yeah. The difference is that as a publisher, we don't provide Rentrack with our ad server data, which is what you would need to calculate ad completion rate, whereas when we consummate a buy with a client and they demand implementing a third-party platform to measure completion rate, some publishers agree to accept those tags, some don't. If you agree to accept it, then that advertiser will have the completion rate data for the ad. So Rentrack's not going to see that on the online side. It's on a client-to-client -client basis, yeah, but it's available. So. Anybody want to say anything about this? You think there's a one-off to doing it in well, pre- I, I think you can negotiate it on a direct, so we're negotiating with ABC and I want to buy it this way this time. Uh, th there's going to be some of that, I think. But uh, functionally, I think that uh, it's going to become baked into the way people evaluate post-campaign how they how they value the the buy. Right. So, how did partner A do against partner B with uh, keeping viewers around our our creative, or delivering brand lift or purchase intent? Yeah. I think I'd agree there. I think it's um, it's something more. You have to look at the value. Um, to you, you can calculate a CPM. You can adjust your price you're paying based upon these attributes, right? Um, I think the piece that's missing in the equation, back to the, the Nielsen conversation, there's the creative. We, we have to keep that in mind. That completion rate might be more mapped to what, what the ad is, um, not where it's running. Sometimes it's the combination, right, of where it's running and what the ad is. So I have to look at it. Right. 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 The lesser of, of evils. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yes, Gian. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So um, we we actually offer that as an option. So if somebody just wants to pay on a completed view basis, that's a pricing model. Uh, it's actually it's not just you and me, it's, I think it's pretty commonplace, at least among video ad networks. Uh, I think you pay a premium for that because you're getting a guarantee on it, uh, and you are 
assuming risk for a bad creative too there, so. So the completed view is 100%? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Like it's true view product and it's all kind of the same, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, so then. So then in digital, people can buy on completed rates. That's a layer that they can put on for the price that they pay. Um, yeah. Viewability is the next topic, sir, which I think I have to transition to now. No, that was my question. I think oh. that there's a lot of, it's. So wait, what happens? What happens, what happens if a robot completes the view? <laughs> In Russia. I also think from a, a publisher point of view, when we're talking about all the different layers that could be added on, you're also talking about a lot of different costs, right? So, you know, for our, when, whether you're using Rentrack or using Nielsen, or whether you're using some other, you know, kind of uh, data, A, how much does that cost? Because that adds up. And you have different agencies, different clients that want different things. B, though, is, is it being tagged correctly? So you might be using the data against the buy that's running on the publisher. A, it might not have ever been tagged. Got a big problem there, right? And B, was it tagged correctly so that you're getting the full snapshot of kind of what you're paying for by using that service? So, you know, it said from the publisher side, the costs that are involved doesn't necessarily equate to the, the campaign that's being delivered in the, in the correct way, if that makes any sense. And I think that that's, that's a hard thing because there is no basis of we're just using, you know, kind of, if we're just using the Vendico tags and using that data, the viewability and the electricity model and all these great things, but there's other, you know, there, there's other services that provide different ways of looking at that that give you different results. So one publisher might look great using one thing, another publisher might look bad using another, and so on and so, so forth. So, so that makes me think that that really is a client-by-client -client decision and who they decide to use for the evaluation will affect what partners they think are performing, overperforming, or underperforming. Um, are you suggesting that the publisher is typically paying for that service or no? Yeah. So false results, contradictory results. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a rabbit hole. I think right now. <laughs> uh, so all right. So we started. We had a little discussion about the qualitative, and maybe it's time spent. Maybe it's brand lift. It it sounds like there's or maybe it's completion rate. There's all these things that are available. Doesn't sound like it should be part of a currency, though. It sounds like it should be part of a, maybe it's a deal term, maybe it's an evaluation metric. It's, it's again, it's one of the layers you can place on it, a campaign to decide if it was, uh, if performance was good or bad. Um, so maybe we have, yeah. So when we're evaluating, it, it seems like the onus is on the publisher to kind of keep that viewer engaged from a completion rate standpoint. How do we account for crappy creative? My point before was if your creative stinks, um, you are arguably gonna have a low completion rate with all media partners. So it sh the evaluation should probably be more about the relative performance of, if you, know, if you have a 50% completion rate across the board because nobody likes your creative, then the guy who delivered 57 looks pretty good to, versus the guy who delivered 32, right? It's relative, yeah. Um, but, and again, you know, you, you can, that's, a, I, to me, it seems like it's a negotiation between the media provider and the buyer about whether or not um, that kind of metric can be used in the price, right? Uh, okay, so we don't have a lot of time. We got a couple of minutes, and this is a pretty heady topic. It's this viewability topic, and um, it's sort of linked with fraud and with, very, very, like the, assump the belief that there is a set of impressions being delivered. You know, Jess uh, showed us something yesterday, and it, I, I think only, not all the sellers were able to see it, but the buyers were able to see it, which essentially laid out the landscape of online video, showing that you have a set of premium publishers who are delivering, for the most part, 
ads that are almost 100% viewable, like 95% viewable in a place where people will see it, spend time with it, it, the opportunity to see is there. For the rest of the marketplace, when you add it all up, uh, it's pretty significant, like 30, 40 percent, upwards of 50, 40 percent uh, of online video impressions today are being served in a place where nobody has the opportunity to see them. That's kind of fucked up. I got to tell you, as a legacy TV guy, I just think that's insane. Um, it bugs the hell out of me. Uh, I understand that it is, it's, it's something that is part of the marketplace right now, and I, I don't think we have enough time to address it in two minutes, unfortunately. I would like to know, um, because it does seem that there is momentum behind the idea of creating a viewability standard for the industry, and the IAB has been working on that with a number of people across the industry. Who's been involved in that? Raise your hand. Okay, so a lot of you guys have been involved in it. David, do you wanna just comment as to where it is? Uh, so I'm on the Blue Ribbon Task Force, new to it. Uh, the last months I've been to a couple meetings, but I've been on the board of the IAB for five years. I'm the vice chair of the IAB. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on this topic, a very important topic indeed. Um, and uh, it's, Coming to, I think, a head, um, the view of the, the body, the governing body of all this is the ANA, the four A's, and the IB, working together on the 3MS task force. So we're all working together on it. Uh, we get together once a year in June and sit down and talk about it. It's a very hot topic. So where it stands today, uh, the MRC is about to lift the advisory on display, not on video. So that's important distinction. So on display, I think at the end of this month, uh, they're going to lift that and we'll be able to, I think, eventually transact on the, I guess it would be what we call a viewable impression from the standard of display is very different. So that, you know, an important distinction. Um, well, I, I, you get into all these different things between the video side and the display side, so let me just try to clear it up. So from uh, display, the MRC is going to lift the advisory at the end of this month, and at that point in time, we can take a look at where the marketplace is, the display marketplace being very different from the video marketplace. Um, just trying to figure out where I want to go with this, because in this world, if you say something in a group like this, it can become a uh, fact very quickly. And there's a lot of things that I'm sitting on in the board and at the 3MS level, and not all of it is for public consumption yet. But say at the end of this month, the advisory is lifted, we can then take a look at what the standards are for a viewable impression and display. So there's a way to do this. Uh, there's two different systems that are in place to see if an impression has been served in the viewable screen. Uh, so we're getting to that uh, very quickly. Right after we get to that, they're gonna have the standards and the MRC will say, these are the standards. After that happens, what you're gonna have is mass chaos in the marketplace, I predict, on the display side for a few months. Because there are five or six companies that can measure viewability, whether it be Moat or Double Verify or DoubleClick or others. And they're all gonna say that they've got the best method for measuring what is a viewable impression. Uh, Horizon will use one, MediaVest will use another, we use a different one. We'll argue that our numbers are better than their numbers. Uh, and for about three to six months, I think we're going to argue on display as to what is a viewable impression and who has the accurate measure of what it is. But we're getting there. So I think it's going to be lifted in the end of this month. The next three months, in second quarter, we're going to try to figure out what it is. And I think it'll become currency for display in the third quarter of this year. That's a prediction. Don't tweet that. Don't talk about that. But I do believe that we'll be transacting on viewable dis uh, impressions and display in the third quarter. For video, it's much more complex. And they just revised and talked about the standards for video in January, February, and released those to the marketplace to an extent where the marketplace is now, the video marketplace is now reacting to that and trying to figure out uh, what are those standards? How are we going to prove that those standards are accurate? And there's all sorts of things that Adam has talked about in the meeting yesterday. A little bit what you saw up here, mobile. 
A lot of our impressions uh, are done through apps, which you cannot m measure at this point in time and won't for quite a while. So do we assume that all of those are viewable impressions when delivered on a tablet uh, and or a smartphone? Probably because of the screen size, et cetera, but arguable. So the viewable impression standard is for video is going to lag display. By how many months and how much time, we don't know, but it's definitely gonna lag display. So we won't be transacting, I believe, on viewable impression until well later into this year, perhaps a new TV year, which starts in October. So um, fourth quarter of this year, maybe. Adam, would you agree to that? Yeah, I agree with it. The, the only thing I would add on the video side, which is an interesting conundrum for everyone in this room, and I, I don't wanna bias anyone's perspective on vendors, so I'm gonna try to not mince my words or mince my words, whatever, yeah. I should have, right? No, 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 but. No, he, I mean, I, st I stumbled here. because there are so many things right. we cannot say at this point. But in here's, here's something to think about in the video specific space, right? Display is not transacted on a demographic basis. There are very few people who are buying demographic guarantees in the display space. You're buying much more sophisticated targeting <laughs> solutions, intent, behavioral, sponsorships, not demographically guaranteed. Video, especially in the premium tier, demographically guaranteed. Now here's the challenge. Viewability in the video space, if you're buying a demographic guarantee, you want to first evaluate how many of the gross impressions are in target, and then how many of those meet the viewable threshold, and that should be the currency. The problem is that the vast majority of the vendors can't measure the demographics at the impression level. They're only measuring viewability. So what, what's going to end up happening is everyone's going to take an OCR composition or impression level of in-target impressions and then apply this total campaign viewability metric from another third party to the demographic impressions and call it a day. I would argue that that's the wrong way to do it because there are going to be a lot of cases where different demographic segments of the viewing audience have different behaviors in terms of viewability. So you need to have a multivariant approach to measuring demographics with viewability in a way that's fair to the marketplace. And I don't think anyone's solved for that yet. Right, so there's no question. Every publisher in the room, every publisher in the industry is behind viewability. It's, it's not defensible to not be behind it. You have to be. It's great for industry. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, folks like Chris will not be pissed off when they read in the Wall Street Journal or other places that 30, 40, 50 percent of impressions are never seen. That all goes away in a better viewable world. So we're behind it 1,000 percent. We're working very hard to get to it. There's just so many nuances and challenges and frustrations, quite frankly, on developing A, the standards, and then B, how the standards get applied into a marketplace that's, that is, you know, between video online video and television, talking about a $75 billion marketplace. Now, television is totally different now, but as it goes more digital, it'll be part of the equation. Non-human traffic, and that's a major issue right now with fraud in the marketplace. So non-human uh, yeah. versus we're, human. We don't have time to go further. So we're going to have to cut off and do a 10-minute break, where uh, we, we could talk about this for for days to come. Um, so let's do a 10-minute break, and we'll be back and talk about content. And this, I would actually recommend that this be a lunchtime uh, tabletop uh, conversation as well, so we can continue to discuss.